Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? How many baseball fans do we have here? Let me throw you a pitch, all right? A couple. Um, Houston won the World Series this year. Of course, my Phillies lost, but anyway, I, I'm the uh, closing pitcher. I'm wearing Blake Snell's jersey. Uh, who's Blake Snell? Um, he was drafted by the Tampa, Ray, Tampa Bay Rays back in 2011, was an outstanding pitcher, but was traded to the San Diego Padres in the last couple of years. The Rays got rid of him. They shouldn't have. They might have won the World Series. But anyway, he was a good pitcher. I'm glad Kevin English let me borrow this, so I want to thank him for the jersey and the glove today. Uh, I feel like I'm the closing pitcher coming into the game and we're closing out Colossians today, all right? We've been in a study of the book of Colossians for the last several weeks, and we've been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, just four chapters through this wonderful book of the New Testament where we see Paul pitching his pitches to the church at Colossae, all right? And he's in prison. He's in the, in the jail in the dungeon in Rome, and he's been arrested for his preaching of the gospel and his waiting trial. And he can have visitors, so he's had some visitors that have come and shared with him about the church in Colossae in Asia and how that church is thriving and growing. And yet there was some false teaching and false doctrine that was being uh, you know, brought into the church. And Paul had a concern for these folks, even though he had never been there. He hadn't started that church directly, but Epaphras had come to him from Colossae and had told him about how the work was going and how Paul needed maybe to write a letter to encourage them to be steadfast and stay with the truth of the gospel and so on. So Paul did that. Timothy helped him write the letter and Epaphras uh, had told him about the church and then he sent Tychicus back with the letter and we'll get into all that today but we want to close out the book of Colossians so have have your Bible turn with me if you would to Colossians chapter 3 we left off last week with verse 17 and today we want to start with verse 18 of chapter 3 and then we'll try to go right through the rest of the book okay let me start with verse 17, Colossians 3, verse 17. Paul says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything is to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. What a verse. What a verse that we need to take to heart and apply to our everyday lives. Everything we do, we should do to the honor and glory of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he directs specific people that were part of the congregation with an a exhortation, with a challenge, and a, and a word of instruction. So we're going to see some six pitches that he throws at these different ones in the church of Colossians. Now the church was a home church, met in a house, probably Philemon's house, and it was made up of a lot of different people. Different households, different families would come to Philemon's house, probably a big living room or so, and they would gather for their weekly gathering of worship and instruction from God's Word and so on, just as we do here even today. But he starts by addressing the wives. How many wives here today? Oh, I shouldn't put my hand up. I'm not a wife. Uh, but you who are married and have husbands, you're a wife. And he addresses you. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. A very direct, very simple statement. If you remember our study in the book of Ephesians, we went through a lot of these very similar verses of instruction that Paul had written to the church of Ephesus. How he says to the wives, wives, you need to submit. Now that is a very important word, a word I'm sure many of you have heard many times, the big S word. 
But it doesn't mean slaves. It doesn't mean you're a slave to do everything that your husband would maybe want you to do. Go get my slippers. All of that, you know. No, it's a word from the military that has to do with falling into rank under the authority of your superior officer. In this case, in the home, the father, the husband, is the leader, should be, spiritually, the lead, take the leadership role in the home. The wife needs to understand that and fall in under the loving leadership of the husband, her husband, not all men. It doesn't say that. It says submit to the husband as it relates to the life of a Christian in your home. As is fitting in the Lord. He interjects the fact that your submission isn't just to him as a person, it's really to the Lord. Each to the other and both to the Lord. It, it conveys certainly the connection that we all have as believers in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we're to honor him as we read in verse 17, in everything that we do. And so when it comes to life and the success of a marriage and a home, then it means, wives, you need to submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And then his pitch is to the husbands. Husbands, how many husbands here? I can raise my hand now. I have a wife. And you who are married, you have a wife. What is your role? As I said, it's to take the loving leadership in the home as the spiritual leader. He says to the husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. He interjects, other than what we saw in the book of Ephesians, this phrase, do not be harsh with them. Oh, how we can all take heart to that and apply that. We have the tendency sometimes to you know, want our own way and to do things in emotions without thinking about it. And God help us to not be harsh with our wives. We're so grateful and thankful for the fact that God has given them to us as our partner. And so we need to recognize them as such. Children, thirdly, obey your parents. Just like we see in Ephesians 6.1. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. As chill, how many children here under 18? A few. Okay. We probably have some next door in the children's kids church today. But anyone that realizes that as they're brought up in a home, in a family, that as a child, your responsibility is to be obedient to your parents. To do that in in reference to your relationship with the Lord. For this pleases the Lord. Your obedience pleases Him. Now you want to please them, I know, by being obedient to them, but really it goes back to the Lord and His relationship that you have and He has with you. And then he addresses fathers. Fathers, and I think this verse implies mothers too, fathers and mothers as parents, do not provoke your children. As we read in Ephesians, don't provoke them to wrath, lest they become discouraged. Oh, how as parents we need to, you know, guard against crossing that line and out of anger and, 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 and spite, you know, say things, do things that we know will later regret it. And they become discouraged by that. And then he says, slaves. In back in those days, there were like 60 million slaves that different ones have. The Bible doesn't really condone slavery, but it does point out that there were slaves, as there were even in our own country years ago. Here, slaves were to be obedient to their masters, obeying them in everything, in everything, those who were their earthly masters, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. You know, don't just please them when they're looking and watching and seeing if you're doing what they want you to do, but even when they aren't even there, you do it as it relates to your responsibility to the Lord. Fearing the Lord. Fearing, again, the connection to Him. And whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men 
knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. It's been pointed out many times that in our society today, slaves could depict employees who work. How many work? You go to a job. You can be like a, not that you're a slave to what they want you to do, what they make you do, no, but in a sense you take these scriptures and you apply them to your relationship with your co-workers as someone who is to work heartily for your boss, for your employer, for your supervisor, but you do it as for the Lord and not for men. When you go to work, when you punch in and punch out each day from work. You need to realize, I'm doing this for the Lord. Yes, I I work. I, 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 I need the paycheck, you know, all of that. But you're doing it for Him. You're doing it as a Uh, task and as a job for the Lord and not just for men. Knowing from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. We've pointed out many times that we say your pay is out of this world (laughs) and it really is. I mean you you want need that paycheck that they give you as your employer but yet we are serving him and our reward someday is the inheritance that he will give us. So you want a good inheritance? Then you work hard now as you go and work every day for the employer that you have. We all are serving the Lord Christ. Notice he sums it up there at the end of verse 24. We all serve Christ. Whatever it is we do. So often as a pastor they look on those of us who are in the ministry as well you're serving the Lord you're serving Christ well yes I am but so are you (laughs) so are you in whatever job you have you're serving the Lord as well now those who he points out that may do wrong and there are those who sometimes we know that try to get away with things we wish they'd get caught but Sometimes that happens and sometimes that doesn't, but the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he has done because there's no partiality. God doesn't play favorites. There's no respecter of persons when it comes to how he sees people. And I hope that you would recognize that in the jobs and work that you do. Going on to chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, his pitch is now to the employer the boss, the supervisor, the ones who may have people that work for them or under them. He says, Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So if you're a supervisor, you're a boss, you have people that work for you and under you, then you need to realize that you have a boss too. Now, you probably do in your workplace, but I'm thinking and talking about spiritually. The master is the Lord, our Lord, our Savior, and the fact that he wants us to all serve him. So, masters, treat your slaves justly, fairly. Someday you want your master, capital M, to return. And when he comes, he wants you want him to be able to say to you that, you are treated fairly and justly as well. I love how the first verse of chapter 4 is connected really with the last verses of chapter 3. But for some reason, they put a chapter division right here. I kind of see it as, well, that's really part of chapter 3. So we put it with the first part of what we want to talk about today. And then he continues on in verse 2 with the second part. And now he addresses all of the church, everyone, all of us together. Doesn't single out any individual. He's saying, really, this applies to everyone. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Another translation says, be devoted to prayer. Can I ask you this morning, how's your prayer life? Well, pastor, don't ask me. It's not what I'd like it to be. Well, that's probably true for all of us. But we certainly need to improve, don't we? Here's how we can improve. Let's take what Paul is challenging us here to heart and say, Lord, help me to be steadfast in my prayers. 
Help me to be consistent in my prayers. Help me to be faithful in praying for others. We so often easily say, oh, I'll pray for you. But do we? Do we actually take the time to actually lift them up to the Lord in prayer? Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful. We saw in Ephesians how prayer is a weapon added to the six pieces of the armor in Ephesians 6. Praying always in the Spirit, Paul said. And now he's saying, be watchful in prayer. And do it with thanksgiving. We all were so thankful Thursday for all that God has given us. And we gave him, I hope you did, you gave him the credit as you thought about the blessings that you have received from the Lord. But you know, every day should be a day of thanksgiving. We should be thanks living and using our prayers as a way to communicate to him our gratitude and our thanks unto God. Praying with thanksgiving. At the same time, Paul said, pray also for us. He asked that they would pray for them as they ministered the gospel, as churches were beginning to be established and started, and people were coming to know Christ. Where's Paul? He's in prison. And yet Paul doesn't, this is so cool, Paul doesn't just ask for prayer for him, he says pray for us. Because he knew that it was a team effort. It wasn't just him alone that was solely responsible for sharing the gospel. He was in jail. How could he do it all by himself? He couldn't. But he had a team of people all over the the countryside that were out ministering the gospel. So he asked that they would remember them in prayer, that God may open to us a door for the word, a door for the gospel to be able to get out, even in jail. Can you imagine someday sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven? We're enjoying the feast with the Lord and sitting right next to you as a Roman soldier that Paul led to Christ when he was in the dungeon in Rome. Can you imagine him telling you that story of how this guy Paul led him to Christ and how he came to know the Lord? I believe that'll happen. That'll be very true because Paul wasn't silent when it came to sharing the good news of the gospel. You know, we would do well to copy the prayers that Paul prayed for while he was in prison. This week's Colossians reading plan, you'll find on the app, by the way, I put it up last night for us to take a look and read the prayers that Paul prayed that are recorded in the prison epistles in Ephesians, in Philippians, in Colossians. There were certain prayers that Paul prayed about. I think it will surprise you if you read that closely as to the prayer requests that Paul had on his mind and in his heart that he was praying for. Notice this verse. It doesn't say... Would you pray that the prison doors here in Rome would be opened and I could get out soon? He didn't pray that. He was praying that, I'm sure he wanted out of jail, wouldn't you? But he's praying that the doors of opportunity would be opened so the gospel could go forth and people could come to know the Lord. And he wanted to be able to declare the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ is a key theme in the book of Colossians. It has to do with the teachings of Jesus, the deity of Christ, how he established the church as his body to carry on his work. All of that is inclusive in that term, the mystery of Christ. On account of which, Paul said, here I am in prison. I've been arrested. I've been put into jail because of my teaching of Jesus and the gospel. And I want you to pray specifically for this reason, that I may make it clear that which I ought to speak. I think sometimes in our prayers, we're so general, aren't we? We, oh, pray for the missionaries, thank you for the food, amen. <laughs> you know, let's be, let's be specific in our prayers. Let's pray that God would, would make it clear when we speak that we would be able to share the gospel in its truth and be able to articulate the teachings that we know are so important to us. And then his challenge again is to everyone in verse 5 when he says, walk 
in wisdom. Remember our theme, walk worthy? Part of walking worthy is to walk wisely. Walk in wisdom, especially toward outsiders. Now, who are the outsiders? They would be anyone outside of the church, outside of Christ. Unbelievers, people who we would meet casually, maybe at the grocery store or when we're in the marketplace or at work or, or any place that we may go. Somebody that was not a part of the church, somebody that was not yet a believer. Let's be sure that we understand how important it is that our, our testimony, our witness is being seen by those around us. Outsiders are watching us. And I wonder if they see Jesus in us. We need to be the feet and the hands of Jesus. Making the best use of our time. Now it says the time, right? The time that God has given to us. We might refer to it as, well, my time. It's not. It's really His time that God gives to each of us. We all have 20, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. What are we doing with the time that God has bestowed upon each of us? A part of our stewardship is to be a good steward of the time that we are given. In this case, Paul's asking that we pray that we would walk wisely when it comes to our time. Making the best use of that time. Letting our speech be gracious, he said, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer each person, each and every person that we may talk to. You may not have the opportunity to get up here and preach to a, a, a room full of people, but casually you might have a conversation with somebody at the store or at work or in your neighborhood. Each and every person is important. Everyone needs to be able to find and grow in their relationship with Christ. So ask that God would help you to be gracious, that your conversation would be seasoned with salt. Salt is a preservative. It's something we put on our food. I remember my mother-in-law, she shouldn't have had the salt that she put on her food in her 90s, but we turn our back and she'd dump on the salt. She'd dump on the salt just to make it flavor and it taste better. Well, we can do that in our conversations with people and uh, ask that God would help us so that we may know how to answer each person. I like what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, that we're to be careful you know, and ready, be prepared to answer anyone that asks us of the reason of the hope that lies within us. So after this paragraph of instruction and exhortation that he gives to the whole church as a whole, he now wants to give some personal greetings and uh, names, 10 different people that he wants to mention by name that will either share a greeting to the church at Colossae or someone that they know that wants to be referenced to as it relates to them. And I love this, this section. It might be Something that you say, well, what can we get out of these names? Well, I think we can get a lot out of it. Ty Ty Tychus. Tychus will tell you, he says, all about my activities. Now remember, he's the mail carrier. He's the one who was with Paul in Rome, having been 10 or 11 years with Paul. Now he had gone to Rome, was with Paul there. He would be the one that Paul was asking to take the letter back to Asia, back to where he was from, back to the church of Colossae. And he says, and he's a beloved brother. He's a faithful minister. He's a fellow servant in the Lord. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a missionary. He wasn't an apostle. He was Tychicus, just an ordinary guy in the church who had been a follower and a devoted disciple of Jesus and had now traveled with Paul as a companion of Paul for some 10 or 11 years. Very faithful when it came to the service of the Lord. So you see, you don't have to have these roles and positions and offices to be able to be a faithful servant as you serve the Lord. And I love Tychicus as being someone who represented that. And then he says, and I've sent him to you for this reason, for this purpose, that you may know how we are doing and that he may encourage your hearts. 
Tychicus was part of the care team of Paul. And Paul was sending them back to Colossae so that he could come alongside of them and encourage them and comfort them and build them up in the faith. And with him, Onesimus. Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who's one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Now, you know about Onesimus? I want you to go to the book of Philemon, just right there at the end of the New Testament. Read that little story of Philemon that Paul wrote while he was in prison, probably around the same time that he wrote Ephesus and he wrote the book of Colossians. He wrote that little epistle of Philemon. Philemon is the host, probably the one who's hosting the church in his home, had had a slave named Onesimus that had probably stolen something from him and had run away. But somehow God had orchestrated it all so that Onesimus would encounter Paul and come to know Christ and accept the Lord as his Savior. Paul was now sending him back to Philemon with the letter of Colossians and along with that, with the hopes that Onesimus would be able to you know, confront his old boss and apologize and tell him how sorry he was. And Paul's asking Philemon to accept him, to welcome him back, to forgive him. And they together would tell them of all that had happened with Paul while he was in Rome. And then there's Aristocarchus. I don't know if you had a child, you'd name him Aristocarchus, but they had those kind of names then. My fellow prisoner, he greets you. So apparently this was someone, and he's mentioned in Acts, as being a faithful companion of Paul. And along with him would be Mark. This would be John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instruction. And we know the story from Acts of how John Mark had gone with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary trip. But then John Mark decided he'd go back to Jerusalem. So he left Paul. And they kind of parted ways. Barnabas later took John Mark and he, they went off on a missionary journey. Paul decided years later, John Mark would be profitable, he said in Timothy, for me in the work of the ministry. So they must have had some kind of reconciliation. And here's John Mark with Paul as he's in prison. And he's asking them, when he comes, if he comes to visit you, you welcome him. And all that has happened is in the past and it's all forgiven. I love that. And then, and then he says, and then there's Jesus who's called Justice. Now this isn't the Jesus, but he had his name and they called him Justice. You can understand why, you know, he'd be mistaken with Jesus, but they called him Justice. Nothing else is said about him. You know, there might be someone that says, well, I'm just uh, doing my job here at the church. No one really knows me or what I do. Well, yes, they do. Here's a man who was mentioned in the scriptures for everyone in all generations to read where nothing else is said in all the Bible about him. But there he is as being a co-worker and a companion of Paul. He says, These are the only men of the circumcision among whom my fellow workers who are among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they've been a comfort to me. They've been an encouragement to me. And what a joy that is to read that. And then Epaphras, Pastor Epaphras. He had come from the church of Colossians with the word of how the church was doing. And he was the one who had told Paul of all that was happening back in Colossae. Epaphras who's one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus. He greets you. He says hello, your pastor who's not with you because he's here with me in Rome. He wants you to know he's struggling on your behalf in his prayers for you. He would stay up late at night praying for these dear ones back in his home church by name. And he would remember them in prayer, agonizing, fervent prayer for, th for them. You know, as a pastor here at Fuel, I want you to know your pastors pray for you. I hope you know that. But 
We fervently pray that God would continue to work in your lives and in your hearts as much as I see him praying for these people back in his church as well. He's praying specifically that they may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. And what a prayer request that is. And he says, and I bear him witness. I'm here to testify that he's worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea, and Heropolis. I love Epaphras. He had been the one to start the church in the first place. But not only that church, he had started Heropolis, and he had probably gone up to, this, up to uh, uh, Laodicea and start that church too. So here he was, faithfully still serving the Lord. Luke is mentioned in the next verse. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. We know Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Luke's now with Paul in Rome. He had been traveling with him on his third missionary journey and was still there ministering to Paul even as a prisoner in Rome. He greets them. They were probably aware of who he was and would recognize his name. And also Demas. Now we know from other scriptures Demas was a co-laborer of Paul but later, a few years, a couple of years later, he would be one, according to 2 Timothy, that would love the things of this world and for some reason left the work of the Lord to follow things of this world and left Paul uh, as a result of that. But th- he was still serving here at this point. And then he says, And give my greetings to the brothers up at Laodicea, to the church there, and to Nympha. Now he mentions apparently a woman who is uh, part of the church in Laodicea and is hosting one of the house churches. They didn't have buildings like we do. They weren't leasing space. They had homes and they met in homes. One of the homes of the Laodicean church apparently was the home of this woman, Nympha. We aren't told a lot other than this reference to her here. But here she was, a wonderful host, hosting the study that was there in her house. And he says, and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. They were to read it too. And see that it also, you also read the letter from them, from the Laodiceans. They had written a letter apparently. Some think this might have been the the letter of Ephesians, but I think it was a specific letter that they wrote also to be read in the church of Colossians. I'd love to see a copy of that, wouldn't you? And then he says, and I want you to say to Archippus, Archippus, the son of Philemon, who was there in the home, part of the congregation, coming up, growing up in the home of Philemon, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Apparently, Archippus A young man in the home of Philemon had felt God's call on his life to go into full-time service. And Paul was saying to the church, Church, I want you to encourage him. Encourage those who want to go into the ministry to continue to go steadfast. We have some in our church, praise the Lord, that have that desire. We'd like to see even more. We'd love to have many from our church that would feel God's call and sense God's call and would respond to that call and fulfill the ministry that God has placed in their heart to serve Him. And then Paul ends the letter with taking the pen out of his pocket, probably not a ballpoint pen, but an ink pen that would dip into the ink, and he signed it himself. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And I want you to remember my chains. Remember as I write this, my arm is chained to a guard here in the dungeon in Rome. But as I am faithful in serving the Lord, that's what I want you to be. I want you to be faithful in serving Him too. Grace be with you all. Amen. God's riches at Christ's expense. His unmerited favor. That great word, shalom, grace be unto you. Now as we've read this scripture today, I see one very important takeaway that I wanted to share with you as I close. One really, to me, 
thing that stands out about all these verses that we've gone over today, and it's this. Every person matters. Wives, husbands, children, slaves, masters. Then in chapter 4, he names 10 different people who send their greetings. Every person matters. Every person matters to God, and every person matters to that church and to us as a church as well. Sometimes we, you know, we feel, well, no one really knows me. No one cares that I come or that I don't come. But we do care. We want you to know that we care. God cares. And one thing that I see, a couple things I see about that point that every person matters is this. Every person matters because every soul is a soul for whom Christ died. His redemption, his salvation is for everyone. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every person is part of John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... You see, every person is part of that whosoever. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, Jesus loves you. He died for you. He paid the price for your sin on the cross. And all he wants you to do is to recognize that, realize you're a sinner, recognize that he loves you and died for you, and receive him as your personal savior. Onesimus, a runaway slave, stole from his master, but his life was dramatically changed by the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ because he came to know Christ and trusted in him. And everything was different after as a result. So not only are you important and every person matters because every soul is a soul for whom Christ died, secondly, Every individual who comes to to Christ in faith, God has a desire to see you grow, to see you mature, to see you going on in, in your faith in the Lord. So his desire is that you be a devoted follower of Jesus. Yes, he wants you on Jesus' team, but he wants you also to be on a church's team too, like Fuel. As you come here, we want you to realize that we want you to be a part of our church family and become an integral part of our church. Every one of these, it seems like, were connected with a church. They were church people. They were local church people. They weren't just believers who were scattered in their neighborhoods and, and living their life before the Lord. They were part of a community, a part of a, a, of a gathering of God's people in a local place, in a home, Philemon's home, Nympha's home up in Laodicea and so on. We have a gathering of people that we call Fuel Church. And it's here in North Lakeland for a reason, that we together collectively might help in in achieving our mission of helping people find and grow in their relationship with Christ. We, We just pray that God would help you to see how you need to be a part of that. And then I love the fact that how every one of these individuals was was on a mission. They were part of the mission, his mission. We're part of his mission. And that mission is to serve our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So I pray that God would help us today to take this this scripture to heart. It's been my privilege to close out Colossians with you and to just share with you some of these truths today that I hope that we would take to heart. As I said earlier in my message a couple weeks ago, I think this message, these, uh, these scriptures are for us individually, but also collectively as a church. We need to apply them as a church. So let's ask, what can we take and apply to us here at Fuel as it relates to our responsibility before the Lord? So thank you for listening to Pastor Norm today. And let me close by asking you to remember my wife in prayer. She just came home from the hospital Thursday. She spent eight eight days in the hospital, had an ablation, She's been having trouble with her AFib uh, 
Matt, you know all about that, don't you? And uh, they gave her a stronger medicine now that she's able to, to help with that, but she's still feeling somewhat worn out from the eight days in the hospital. And she, I know, would appreciate your prayers for him, so for, for her. So if you would just remember her. And grace be unto you, too, okay? Just as Paul closed, I'll close with that. May God's grace be upon us as a church, and may God's grace be upon you. Let's pray. Stand with me as we pray. Father, we just thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity this morning to open and study your word. As we've tried to close out Colossians, I pray that you would help us to see how important it is that we are faithful to you in our lives, that we are devoted disciples of Jesus in every way. And whatever we do, we do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Help us to realize that whatever we do, we're to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we're a wife, a husband, children, whether employees, employers, or whether we're just individuals with different roles and responsibilities, uh, not all are called to be pastors. Some are and some aren't. But I pray that you would help us to see that your intent is for us to be all on mission, that we all would be faithful, that we all someday would hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. And if I can ask that if there be anyone today that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that you would help them to put their faith and trust in you and become a part of Team Jesus. And then if there be some who are already believers but are looking for a good Bible-believing church, I pray that you would help them to see that they can become a part of Team Fuel and be a part of our church family and serve the Lord Jesus here with us. We ask your blessing on each one. Dismiss us with your blessing. May we go from this place with the determination to help others find and grow in their relationship with Christ. To this end we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.